So as I was sitting there and preparing for this message, thinking about these texts and, and thinking about the direction we were going to take things as we continue kind of this Lenten series of things we give up for God, um, Pastor Greg last week was talking, uh, or on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, I guess, was talking about giving up control to God. And so I was moving in, okay, next steps, giving up some different ideas that we have about God, false ideas. And I was thinking, well, what makes us think of, of things that we believe in or at different stages in life we believe in? And, and there may be um, kind of interesting or false beliefs. And, and the first thing that I was starting to think about was like, like there's ideas and beliefs we have about Santa and the Easter Bunny. And I'm like, there's lingering children here. Don't say anything more. Okay, we're going to leave some those things to the side. I'm like, let's go with the tooth fairy, right? The tooth fairy is pretty safe, right? We can talk about the tooth fairy. Now, my kids, um, my two oldest boys um, grew up with the tooth ninja, not just the tooth fairy, all right? Um, but regardless of what we might have called this figure, the reality is that there may have been some false conceptions that they had about this figure. Um, and, and, you know, maybe this was because, like, you know, they wondered, how powerful is the, the tooth fairy? Because is the tooth fairy just that busy that there's times when we put our teeth under the pillow and the next morning we wake up and the tooth is still there and there's no money there? Hmm, I wonder how that could have possibly happened. It must have been the tooth fairy's fault, right? Maybe the tooth fairy is just too busy to get to my pillow. Or maybe that's what my parents told me is the tooth fairy must have had a really busy night, Right? Um, or maybe they wondered sometimes, does the, does the tooth fairy or tooth ninja even, even care about me or whatever? Does they, do they care about the tooth? Because there's some nights when we put the tooth under the pillow and I wake up the next morning and there's money there, but, but the tooth is still there. You know, what's the deal? Does the tooth fairy just not care about the tooth? And I, I certainly, um, it never could have possibly happened in our house one time when the child woke up the next morning, retrieved the money, and the tooth was gone, and then wondered if the tooth fairy really cared about the tooth because they went and opened up the garbage, and there might have been a tooth still in the garbage. Yeah, yeah. They might have had some interesting conceptions and, and limitations that they, they thought about with the tooth fairy. That's all kind of to the side, right? I want to talk about a different, much more important figure, obviously, this morning. I want to talk about our belief in God and our ideas about God. Now, if you're in this room, my guess is that we all come here with a common faith and a trust and a belief in God. We confess some of that in the words of the Apostles' Creed just a, a little bit ago. And that, that puts us in a really good place, all right? And so there's this, this common unifying ground that we believe in God. That is a good thing. Um, but the challenge for us is that even though we believe in God, there are still some probably false ideas we get about God. And I don't mean that that takes us out of the faith. But, but there are these things that are, are stopping and putting obstructions and walls between us and God. And I remember being confronted with this um, right about 12 years ago, this time of year. And it happened when, when everything had fallen apart in life, and I would, knew I was struggling with some addiction. And so I'd started a 12-step recovery program, and I'd gotten a sponsor. And I remember sitting down with the sponsor after the first meeting. This is the second meeting. We're sitting there in a restaurant, and he's sitting there and been listening to me, listening to me, listening to me, talk, 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 talk. And finally he says, Dan, I want to tell you something important. I said, okay, okay, tell me. And he said, Dan, I believe you are what we call a Christian atheist. And for a moment, I just sat there, and I sat there, and I thought about it, and the thought went through my head, and then I started getting really, really upset. Like, man, I had told him how deep and how strong my convictions were in my God, and he was sitting here and calling me a what? I didn't even understand the term. What is a Christian atheist? I didn't yell at him. I was you know, pretty quiet. I mean, the guy was my sponsor. He's helping me out, right? But I asked him, what do you mean? He said, Dan, no offense. I, I, I see how sincere your trust in God is, how much you love him and know that he loves you in some sense. But it seems like there's some things going on and some false ideas that have worked their way into your life. Because you talked about how often you've prayed to God just to take stuff out of your life. And it seems like at some point in time you either quit believing that God could or that he was willing to take these things from you. I was sitting there and thinking about that as it rolled through my mind, and I realized he'd nailed me. 
that over time in my life, and who knows exactly when these things had started to happen, but these false ideas had started to build themselves up in my life at some point in time, in some of my struggles with some of my sin, I had started to like wonder, okay, like God, if I've asked you enough times to deal with this and it hasn't happened yet, then maybe at some point in time I had started to give up and wonder, could God or would God? I believe that everyone here believes in God and trusts in him. But I wonder if maybe there's some false conceptions that you all have about God too. Maybe some of the things that I I just talked about resonated with you. Maybe you're like, okay, yes, I absolutely 100% believe in God, um, but are there ways in which this wonder kind of comes around? Does God really care about parts of my life? I know he cares about me and he loves the whole world, but does he really care about like the daily stuff? Like every single day when I'm feeling kind of sad or when I'm feeling anxious and, and it's just a completely normal day what I'm struggling with, with sad or anxious or these bad thoughts about the past that come to me and that's just a normal daily kind of thing that happens. Does God really care about that? Or maybe some of those things that get stuck in our life. And whether it's addictions like I was struggling with or, or whether it's just kind of stuff that seems more normal or whatever, you're like, does God really care that I blew up at my kids again? Does God really care that I looked at something on the internet that I shouldn't have looked at? Does God really care that I took another drink? Because these things happen day in, day out. Does God really care about that kind of stuff? I know God cares about the big things in life. I know God cares about me when someone's sick and and about to die. But does God care about the normal daily struggles? Does God care not just about the big sins, but about the little sins too? What does God really care about? Or forgive? Or want to bring healing to in my life? And if God cares about those things... Why doesn't he just kind of whisk it away from life in some kind of easy fashion, right? Wouldn't that be the way a caring God would work? Well, when we have these kinds of things that have built up in our heads, we need to sit there and go back to God and listen to what God tells us about himself. And so I want us to listen to Psalm 103 and some sections from it again here. For God knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field, for the wind passes over and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to his children's children. Did you hear that? Did you hear what it just told us about God? It says that God gets us. He knows that we're what? Dust. Like God's like, I remember, I took the dust and I formed it into the first man and I breathed my life into it. And if that man was that frail that I could make him out of dust, guess what? Every single one of you are the same way. He gets us. He knows how frail we are. He knows all the pains and the the problems and he knows the little junk that gets stuck in our life every single day as well as the big chunk that might have been stuck in us for a long period of time. He knows how fragile and how broken we are. He knows the things that have been done to us as well as the things that we have done. And how does he react to those things? Is he like, well, I'll I'll check in on you when the big stuff comes? No, 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 no. He not only knows about it, he cares about it in a way that he applies his what? The the word here is steadfast love. And that's that's this beautiful, big Hebrew word, chesed. I'm sure I've mentioned it before, or maybe you've heard it mentioned before. Um, It's the love of God that says, I have put a covenant on you, and it's my love coming to you unconditionally to tell you how much I care for you. And when am I going to apply that? Did you hear? From everlasting to what? everlasting. From the very earliest moments of your life, when you were still inside your mother's womb, until you leave this life. And if it's from everlasting to everlasting, it means everything in what? Between. Every single one of those moments when we might have been wondering, does God really care? He says, yes. I've cared about every single one of those moments in your life. And I was with you in those moments. He said something else really kind of beautiful early in the psalm. Lord is merciful 
and gracious, slow to anger and abounding. And here's the word again, in steadfast love. He doesn't have a little bit of it. He's what? Abounding in it. He won't always chide. He won't keep his anger forever. That doesn't mean he doesn't have anger, but he won't keep it. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Does God know our sins? What's the answer? Yes. A lot of times we're like, oh, God gets spiritual amnesia and he just doesn't even realize that I'm a sinner. Does it say that? No, God knows your sins. And despite the fact that he knows every single one of them, even the ones that we don't notice, he knows them. But he cares enough about us that he loves us anyway. And that he would send his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for them. God is not blind and God is not stupid. He knows our sin. But wouldn't you rather have a God that's loving enough that he knows them and loves us and forgives us anyway? I would. That's a caring God. That's a caring God who who we can sit there and start to trust in life and we can start to to trust our sins to him and all the brokenness and just the traumas, the stuff that we didn't cause at all. Can we give that kind of stuff to a God like that too? Yes, he's faithful. He's got this covenant, everlasting love. He is with us in these moments. He cares about every single one of those things, big or small. And you might say, okay, God, but if you love me so much, why not just remove it from life? Why not take that anxiety or that sadness or that fear or that anger or whatever else? Why not just take it right away? Why not just wipe that pain out of my life? And part of that is another one of these false conceptions about God and about what care looks like. Because you see, sometimes a caring God says the pain is teaching you something. Caring God says, I know that if I allow the pain for a period in your life, that you will realize that there is something bad for you and you won't want to go back to that place anymore. And so that when it does leave your life, you're going to be like, not going there again. That was bad for me. And so it's not a God who's oppressive or mean or slow or uncaring. It's actually a very caring God who sometimes allows us to go through the pain. Okay, so maybe you're with me for a little while right now that that God does see, he does know, and he does care. But maybe the question then becomes one of, okay, maybe he cares, but can he do anything about it? Okay, because, um, you know, if God really loves us, okay, and he really cares and he knows these things going on in my life, why doesn't he just kind of take them out um, in, 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 a, in a miraculous, beautiful, powerful way? Why not do it quickly at least, all right? So, okay, maybe I've got to deal with some pain, but couldn't he at least do this in a faster fashion, right? Again, we get these ideas stuck in our heads, and what do we do? We go see what God says. The gospel lesson for today is really instructive on this one. I don't know if you notice the way God works, the way Jesus works. It's really kind of a cool story, a very unique miracle in some ways. Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, and a spirit has seized him that makes him mute. And when it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples, and they couldn't cast it out. And Jesus answered to them, What? O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy, and he was convulsed and rolling about. And Jesus said to the father, how long has it been happening? He said, from childhood. If you can do anything, have compassion. And Jesus said what? Did you notice his response? If you can? It's really interesting, right? Like you sit there and you say, okay, well, Jesus, uh, God, has already created some kind of faith in this man, right? Because the man showed up. So that means that God has already done something. This man had had this son struggling with this for years and years and years, apparently. And God does something in his life that says, today, maybe God can do something about this. So so get your kid. Maybe God cares enough. Um, Just trust him and go find this Jesus guy that God has sent into this world and see. But the man's faith is still struggling. He says, Jesus, if, if you're powerful enough... Can you do something about this? And Jesus says, if. 
you need some more work on that faith, don't you? And so Jesus does some more work on that faith. If you can, he tells him, let me tell you about my power. All things are possible when there's belief. And immediately the father of the child cried out, and I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. What does the man say? I believe. Help my unbelief. How powerful is that? Like, okay, God, you got me this far. Jesus, you've gotten me this far. But I need you to work your power and to grow my faith into what you need it to become. And Jesus says, okay, I'll do it. But it's a what? It's a process. Step by step by step. Over apparently the years of this man's life and this kid's life, God was growing when he needed to happen. And then what does happen? Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter again. And after crying out and convulsing him, it came out. The boy looked like a corpse. Most of them thought he was dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand and he lifted him and he arose. In that moment, after all those years, God had done what he needed to do and he revealed his power in that moment and the spirit was gone. The text ends in an interesting way. The disciples ask him, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus said, this one is only going to come out by prayer. Sometimes we're sitting there and struggling with, with demons in our life, whatever you want to call them, right? With struggles in our life, traumas from the past, anxieties and fears in the present, or, or, or addictions or sins or whatever that we've been stuck with so long in life. Then we sit there and we wonder, okay, God, maybe you care, but are you powerful enough? And God sits there and he works on things in our life and he says, um, if, no, no, I am powerful enough and we've got to call out to God, okay, God, I believe, help me in my unbelief, grow my faith. And God says, okay, okay, you know how I'm going to grow it? I'm going to use means. Did you notice that? The disciples were like, well, we just wanted it to just disappear. And Jesus said, ah, oh, this one had to come out by prayer. It needed some extra means. Sometimes that seems weird to us. We're like, okay, God, like if you can just do it, why not just do it? Why do we have to use any of these means? And, and what's interesting, though, is we've learned within the church to trust in means. We've learned, oh, yes, we pray. Yes, we read the Bible. Yes, we come to the Lord's Supper. Yes, we baptize babies. Yes, we come to church. So we're used to means, and God says, I am going to keep using means every single day of your life. Yes, prayer and scripture and all kinds of other things, including some means that are less comfortable. Remember when I was sitting there and struggling, uh, I mean, like, honestly, like 20 years in this addiction, and I kept praying to God, just take it, just take it, just take it. And he said, oh, Dan, there's some means I want to use. I want you to quit holding this inside you. I want you to go talk to other brothers in Christ. And I want you to tell them all the things you have been struggling with. And I'm like, ah, no thank you, God. And he said, no, if you want it gone, then use means. And he said, I want you to also go out to people that you've hurt. And I want you to go apologize to them and make amends with them. And I said, ah, no thank you, God. And God said, ah, yes. I'm going to use means. And God was good and God was powerful. And he used some of those means that he talks about all throughout the scripture. And he worked healing in my life after over 20 years of struggle. God is powerful. But he likes to use means. And sometimes... God gives these amazing recoveries and, and one day there's a sin or a trauma or a brokenness or a pain and the next day it's gone. I've talked to people and I've heard those stories. Praise God. Just like those miraculous healings that he gives sometimes, right? Where one day a person's sick and the next day they're better. Praise God for it. But I've also talked to countless people and celebrate recovery and other 12-step programs who are like, oh, the only way I got better was when I let God use means. And when I started to trust that a powerful God works through things and people in this earth. We get a lot of ideas stuck in our heads over the years about all kinds of things in this world, whether it's people or, or figures. We work through those. The things that get stuck in our head about God sometimes are much more subtle and much more difficult to bring to the surface. 
And so I'm thankful that we have this chance, this Lent, to sit there and to think about the things that we want to give up. Like I said, on Wednesday, Pastor Greg confronted us with one of the hardest beliefs, which is um, everything goes better when I'm in control. And, And he confronted us with that and said, oh, God wants you to give up control. My prayer is this morning that this text and these texts have helped us start to think about some of the ideas that have gotten stuck in our head about God. Because we do have a good, caring God who is powerful enough to bring relief and recovery from just about everything in life. If, it's not if. God can and he will because he is powerful and loving and caring. And so this Lent, what better things can we give up than some of those false beliefs about God, whether these ones or something else? Amen?